everything is controlled using uh, variables, the, the positions in here. So if I go to my uh, name expressions, you can see I have the rotation values for all of the rotary actuators in here. So if I just change the value of uh, one rotation here, you can see the position is updated automatically. It's pretty convenient. And we'll be able to reuse that set of variables for uh, our thermal mount system here. The first step is to create the, uh, the FEM files. In this case, since I have an ICAD that's uh, already well parameterized, I'm going to use an associated assembly fan. Let me just brief you very quickly on assembly fans. Again, same as yesterday, so assembly fans is what we use to create complex assembly of uh, FE models. That allows you to reuse uh, models. So for example, uh, my rotary actuator, I won't have to mesh it seven times, right? I'll just mesh it once and I'll uh, reuse that same mesh exactly for all the other rotary actuators in the model. Um, and also since it, it's uh, associated, the software will uh, automatically detect where those actuators are positioned in the CAD assembly and will position them in the right locations. And if I change the position of the CAD assembly, well, I'll have a, an option to tell the software to update the FE model at the same time. Going back here, I'll create my assembly pen. I'll just uh, call it uh, Maya Arm. I'll use the space system thermal module. And here, just change the background. I have my assembly fan here that was uh, generated. And you can see the architecture here. I have all of my uh, components that were on the family tree on the other side. Now, all I need to do is to um, import those fans here to generate this model. I'm not going to actually mesh uh, all of the components. I don't think there's uh, much added value here. I think uh, most of you know how to mesh components right now. So I'm just going to uh, open existing fans and map uh, use map existing instead of mapping new components. So open my fan files, that was the arm. So open the arm. I have two arms. Now you can see they've been positioned properly uh, automatically. I'll import those latching mechanisms. Here, so you can see it's taking shape, the grapple fixture. The casing for the rotary actuators. Here, the ineffective joints, almost done. This one. As you can see, I'm just missing those small connectors here. And you can see every time I map the existing one, uh, I can see a preview here, just to make sure I'm importing the right thing. And the vector connector, that is my connector that goes here. And then all good, I have my uh, assembly fan here. Let me just change the, the color display here because uh, it's, uh, I'm not a big fan of that dull green. Here we are, we have a colorful uh, M here. And everything is in here. And I've uh, just talked very briefly about that association. Again, I've demoed that yesterday, but for uh, in case anyone wasn't here yesterday. If I show by side by side my assembly fan and the part assembly, you can see that uh, everything's positioned properly the right location. And then here, if I go back here and change my, uh, my angles, so it's just uh, Change a couple. And I go back to my assembly fan. I have an option to update. So I don't have to update if I don't want to. In case there's a design you're working on that in the background and he makes modification, I don't want those modifications reflected on my FE model. Well, I can refuse to update. But for this case, I did modifications. So I'll just update. And you can see everything, uh, all the positions are updated automatically. That's pretty useful. Um, here we're just showing positions, but you could also have uh, thermal couplings, boundary conditions, and so on. Uh, 
that depend on position, for example, that would be automatically updated. You could remesh stuff. And since we're associated to the geometry, uh, the software will understand that uh, if you have thermal coupling, for example, between this flange and uh, this flange here, well, the software will understand that you're remeshing and it's going to update that coupling based on the new mesh. So that uh, associatedly is a pretty powerful tool that we have in Sim Center. Just put that back to zero degrees. I'll uh, just put that back on one window so you can see it better. That was pretty quick here. Now you can see I have my robotic arm. Now let's talk about the rotary actuator that hasn't been imported yet. It's going to be on the inside, so uh, we haven't seen it really in the cab. But if I hide those components, uh, the joints, you can see they're uh, on the inside here, those rotary actuators. Now for my example here, let's say that uh, my rotary actuator, I have a model existing in thermal desktop. And I don't want to remesh it. I don't want to redo all of those uh, contactors, heat loads, heaters, and so on. So what I can do is import that model from thermal desktop into Thin Center. Um, back in the days, and when I say back in the days, that was last year, the best option we had would have been to uh, import a simulation from here and then we could have imported the radiation model for a uh, for TSS or where we are using it, Africa. And then you could have imported a uh, step file or anything else to, um, to have those elements only. But that would not import the conductors, contactors, heat load, uh, solution for case sets, whatever. So something we've developed recently is that um, thermal exchanger. Slide on that, so let me show you. Oops, I'll talk about expression afterwards. So thermal model exchanger, it's a free application. It's uh, available for uh, for everyone. It's free to download, and it helps us exchanging thermal model between Sim Center and Thermal Desktop. The versions that we support are uh, on Sim Center side. It would be an X1980 plus. So anything more recent than that would be fine. And on the Thermal Desktop side. We use 6.2 or higher. I believe 6.3 is out uh, now. And this is something we've developed with the OpenTD API, so the programming uh, language that was added or interface that was added in thermal desktop in version 6.1. This is uh, what allowed us to uh, make something a bit fancier than what we had previously. The way we do the exchange of files it is through the XML file, SimCenter XML file, and that's really a software input file for us. So whenever we solve a solution within SimCenter, it writes that file and sends it to the thermal solver. And uh, with the software, we can also import a case set from thermal desktop and write an XML file from that. And the exchange, well, we've limited that to uh, SI units in Kelvin. It's pretty easy to change the units uh, in both software. So we didn't really see the point in uh, supporting many different types of units. That would have been a, a source of confusion. So while I was talking, this uh, open. Let me just see if I can read that. So let me open my uh, very simple rotary actuator model here. Very well, so you can see I have a, it's a pretty simple model, right? To have the rotor state factor. If I look at the uh, contactors, you'll see I have a couple of contactors defined, so very simple stuff. Uh, the shaft and the gearbox, uh, two locations. I'll have the heat load as well. It's, it's called heater. I didn't really uh, bother uh, adding logic to that, so it's really just a heat load. But it could have been a heater as well. So let's say I want to export that rotary actuator uh, as an XML file. This here is the interface for our uh, thermal model exchanger. So um, I'll just uh, update that. And this detects all of the case sets that are defined in the thermal desktop. I have only this one now, so it detects only this. But if I had several, I could uh, pick and choose which case set I want to export. And then I'm going to export that to an XML file. So let's uh, just put it in here somewhere.
So you can see it's exported. It's exporting materials, the thickness of the cool properties, the heat load, the contactors. So everything seems fine. Works really well for a simple model like that. If I had more complex models, I imagine I would see warnings appear in here. And maybe we'll see warnings actually uh, at the end, because at the end I'll uh, transfer everything back to the desktop. But that gives you a small summary of what's been done. And if I go here, I should see my XML file that's been written. Now from SimCenter, I can import that XML file. So I'll just go to File, Import. And I'll uh, import that as a simulation file. Space system thermal. And I want to choose the solver input XML file in here and just browse to that file I just created. And if I press OK, it asks me where do I want to save that. I'll just uh, keep the default values in here. So that's it. You can see everything's imported. It imported the boundary conditions, mesh meshes, modeling objects. So if I just uh, take a quick look at the model here, you can see I have the two parts, my motor gear box on the other side. I have my two contactors were imported properly. So it's uh, hidden on the inside. But, uh, you can see the couplings uh, from the shaft to the, the other side. I have my heat load. The values have been converted to microwatts, but it's the same value as before. Uh, everything was transferred properly. If that's okay, so I'll just uh, save this file here and move back to my um, assembly fan. And now I can import that rotary actuator which I uh, into my assembly fan. So I'll map the existing fan, use this guy here. And now if I show, if I hide um, some of those uh, end effectors, you can see they've been imported. They're already properly positioned. So that's fantastic. My fan is ready. I already have some of the simulation objects for that uh, rotary actuator. So I could, um, if I wanted to import them into my simulation afterwards. Well, I'll just talk about that briefly a little bit when I uh, get to my simulation. So that's about it. I think my assembly fan is ready for, uh, for simulation. So I'll just create a new simulation from here, I'll use my space system thermal uh, template. I'll just use the default option for now. Create my solution. And from here, this is where I would start adding all of my thermal couplings and the uh, heat loads, the heaters, if I wanted, on my rotary actuators. If I wanted to import the simulation entities from uh, this other simulation file, I could just uh, import simulation entities from here. If I wanted to create thermal couplings, I would uh, just create thermal couplings from here. My radiation objects, uh, orbital heating, if I want, or solar heating, LT coolers, uh, or heaters, whatever I want, heat loads, band resets. I'm not going to um, show you how to do the full uh, simulation in this demo. Instead, I want to spend a bit more time talking about those um, those positions of the arm here. Because in this type of analysis, you can imagine you're not going to run the, the analysis in only one position. You may want to uh, move the position of the arm as you're running a thermal analysis, so to have the transient movement during the thermal analysis. If you wanted to do that, what we would use is the solid motion effect. And I've talked about that yesterday in the demo for, about the lunar rover. I'm not going to um, re reiterate that today. Instead, I'll talk about doing uh, analysis and fixed position here. As I've shown you before, let me just split the windows here. So uh, I'll put the cat on the side. So now you can see I have my part file, my assembly fan and my simulation all shown within the same interface. I'll just uh, synchronize everything. So if I wanted to modify the position in one analysis for my uh, robotic arm, what I would do is I would go back to the part file, as I've shown you before, change the value of the expression. So let me just uh, do that. 
it's not the rebound, just to demo. Swipe, change the position in here, go back to my SMFM, update the file, and then go back to the same. And now everything's updated. And it works quite well with the associated but it's a bit bothersome. I find because uh, every time I want to modify the position, I have to go through this whole process. And it's something that's pretty repetitive. So instead of um, doing that process here, I know that something I can look into using is uh, journals. Let's talk about journals now for a second. Journals, they're essentially just a way to record a number of uh, user operations that you do. So you can uh, start recording a journal, do a bunch of operations, stop recording. And then later on, you can repeat all of those operations with just one click of the mouse. Uh, there are many advantages to that. So you can uh, automate the repetitive sequences of operation. For example, uh, this is a more complex assembly, but if I had something a bit more simpler, like a, a reflector, for example, that has only really two positions, one which is stored, one, one which is deployed, I could create buttons like that. So just record the operations to store it, record the operation to deploy it. And just click store, click deploy whenever I want to change the orientation. It's a pretty quick way to uh, change from one uh, arrangement to the next. When you when you have a more complex assembly like that, there's uh, something fancier that you can do, and we'll uh, demo that very very soon. Is you can pass arguments to those journals. So in here you can see I have a more complex assembly with many joints and an infinite number of positions. So when I record my journal, I'm going to assign very specific values for the rotation. But let's say in the future, I want to uh, use different values for the rotation. I don't want to record a new journal, right? So I can just pass arguments instead, pass the angles as arguments, and tell the software, just rotate that to those specific angles automatically. So we'll show how to do that uh, in the software. You, all of those journals are saved as scripts, and you can choose the language, uh, typically it's either C Sharp, Scott Plus, PB, or Python that you can use. And since everything is saved as script, it gives you access to very advanced uh, options. So if you'd like to do some more complex operations, uh, for example, if you have one solution, you, have, you want a specific set of uh, positions, and one other solution, you want other positions, other uh, angles, you could just tell the script, go and open uh, an Excel file, for example, or a CSV file, look at the, the values for all of my parameters in there, update the model, and then run the solution afterwards. You could, uh, so you could read the solution name, uh, automate everything based on that. You could combine that with the parameters table, which is essentially an Excel file uh, within the solver that uh, shows you for this set of solution, I want to use those values for the expressions and so on. It's a lot of information in one go, so I'll just do a, a quick demo in the software here. So I'm going to record those um, those two uh, scripts, those two journals, to automate uh, storing and deploying. The way you record those journals, you have uh, access to uh, the journals from either menu, tools, journals, and you can record or play from here. Or if you activate that developer tab, you can just press on this to record. So I'll make sure I'm in my same file. I'll record the journal to store that arm. So now it asks me where do I want to save that. Uh, I'll just put it in here somewhere. I think I'll leave a folder for journals. And I'll call that store. That will be my uh, journal for storing. So now you can see those uh, green squares that appeared. It tells me that the Solver, the software is currently recording all of the operations that, that I do. I'm going to go back to that part file. I'll open the expressions window and I'll set everything back to zero degrees. By the way, I see the questions pop up in the chat. I'll address them at the end just so I don't lose the, the thread as I'm talking, but uh, I'll get to those, don't worry. So we see everything's updated here. I'll go back to my FEM update the position in here, go back to my sim, everything's done, so I'll just stop recording at this point. Now if I go and look at my journals, I see I have the journal that appeared for the store operation. 
I'll do that again just to uh, for the deployment operations. I'll do a second journal, I'll call it deploy. And same thing, I go back to my part file, just modify a couple of angles. I'm not going to actually modify all seven because it's a bit longer than necessary. So that we take it easy. Oops. Degrees. Uh, good. So I'll press OK. Go back to my SIM defam again. Update. Go back to my SIM. I'll stop recording. And now I should have my second journal that appears here. If I want to execute those journals, uh, you have a shortcut. I believe it's Control U, uh, with which you can, uh, and that would be for an executing script. So you can you have a shortcut to execute the journals. You can execute them from uh, here, from that menu, tools, journals, and you can play a journal just from here directly. In my case, I, I find that's a bit long, so I'm just going to do to add some um, buttons in here to execute those journals directly. So I'll customize my toolbar, add two buttons here. This one will be to uh, slow. Change the icon for something a bit more visible. Now I want to edit the action and point to my journal file that it just created. I save it as C sharp. Set that to. Press OK. I'll edit the second one that will be the toy. It's a good, nice icon. Edit the action again and point to my deploy script. C sharp. Okay, so now you see I have those two buttons. If I click on that, if I want to store it, I'll just click on my store button. And then now you can see the software is automatically repeating those operations for me. I can deploy it again. And you can see it's a very quick way to just change the orientation. But again, just uh, this set of operation, it's not perfect because it's deploying at further constant um, angles without the client before. So let's say I want to pass arguments instead and uh, use different values for, uh, for the angles in here. I'll just put that back to the scope position. I mentioned before we can pass arguments. To do that, I'll just customize those buttons again. That's one way to do it. I'll talk about a way to do it afterwards. And in my deploy uh, script, I can edit the action and enter action arguments in here. So uh, just to understand that, let's look at the script uh, quickly. So you can see this script, is, it's actually pretty complex for something that's uh, very simple where we're just making three rotations. The good news is you don't have to understand any of that. I know I don't. So uh, the, understanding, the only thing you need to understand at this point is that you're uh, passing arguments through here. So that would be an array of strings. And you're going to be stored in args in, uh, in this. So if I go down below, I can look at, uh, go and find the values that I've assigned. So you can see I made a mistake in my script. Over. I put 60 degrees and then 90 degrees, uh, I corrected that. Doesn't matter. And then I hide my third value for the rotation four, which is 90 degrees as well. Now, let's say I want to pass arguments instead of using fixed numbers. I'll go back here, I can enter my uh, values in here, so I'll just use uh, three times 45 degrees. Press OK. And now I need to tell the script that I'm using those arguments in instead of a, a thick value here. So I'll just call uh, my arguments uh, uh, zero. Oops, uh, what language am I using? OK, so that should work. So here I'm calling my first argument for the first rotation angle. Here I modified that twice, so that should be this guy here. I'm using my second argument, so it's uh, indexed from uh, zero, in case we're wondering. My third rotation angle, I'll just save that and see if I did that properly. So now I'll try to deploy. And you can see now you have rotation angles of 45 degrees instead. 
And if I store it again, well, it's just assigned the angle to, uh, to zero degrees, right? So I don't need to modify anything in my stove script. So as I said, a pretty useful tool. It's easy to um, change the angles in here. I could do it for all of my uh, seven um, rotary actuators. But again, it's not absolutely perfect at this point because you have seven rotary actuators. And you can imagine that you may want to automate some more stuff in there. You may want to change heat loads and uh, additional stuff in different solutions. So you have um, other options that you can use for that. Knowing that it's a script, you can do pretty much anything you want, right? So uh, let's see in here. One thing I could do is I could uh, modify my solution name and just enter the value of my my three angles from here. And in my script, instead of passing the arguments from this, so instead of uh, having to customize and edit the action arguments in here to change those every time, I could just edit my solution name, put the angles in here, and in the script, go and tell the script, instead of uh, looking at the arguments from here, just go and read the solution name, parse it to uh, get those three numbers and use them to uh, set the angles instead. So that would be really probably, well, easy enough to do. Just one additional line and then parsing that line uh, in that script. So again, you don't need to understand this whole thing here. You just need to uh, add something at the top here to read the solution name. Uh, there are more, many more things that you could do. I've talked about parameter tables before. So let me just uh, show you that. Parameter tables, I'll just uh, create a new one just for the example. It's essentially a way to say uh, when you have a bunch of expressions, symbols if you want, it's the same thing. So I would have my seven rotation angles. And here I can add configuration. So I can have a number of configurations. So I can have the stored state, uh, deployed state, uh, something for an operation phase. Uh, so any number of configuration I want. And, gen and then you pick and choose which configuration you want to run. So if you combine that with a journal, instead of uh, changing manually or uh, in action arguments all of the values, you could just create a table. You can import something from Excel for this and uh, set all of the expressions here, the values you want for this specific solution. So you could create a, a journal that just reads in that solution name, opens this table and uh, picks the configuration that corresponds to that so specific solution. That would be easy enough to do. And, uh, here, I just wanted to show you if you want to, exp to import something from a file, you can just import that table directly from an Excel uh, workbook or, or CSV file if you want. So you could use that to uh, control many, many parameters at the same time automatically. So you just uh, do your table in Excel and automate everything using the journal. You could have many solutions, each solution pointing to a different configuration. It's relatively easy to set up. Uh, maybe um, just a couple of other things I want to mention at this point. This here uh, in my demo, it works pretty well because I have all of my uh, arguments or variables already set in the CAD file. Very often, you won't have um, a CAD file that was done in SimCenter directly. You'll import something from uh, from another software. And when you do, typically, you lose all of those variables that were defined by the designer. So you need to redefine all of those yourself. And, and that's something that can be done as well. So within the assembly pen, when you add components here, I was using an associated assembly pen, so just uh, automatically knew where to position the components based on the, the CAD. You, you could do several things. You could still have an associated pen with a, an imported geometry, or you could have uh, an unassociated pen and then do movement operations on those pens. So you could, uh, in here, I won't be able to do it because it's associated, but you typically can just right click and move the pen and you'll have access to similar operations uh, as you would in a CAD assembly. So you can rotate position, uh, align with coordinate systems. So you could automate a bunch of operations like that using journals again. So you enter uh, angles uh, about access uh, for some of those actuators, do the operations that you want, record them in a journal, and then edit the journal to uh, change the angles and everything 
want. So you could do that with a non-necessary assembly plan if the, the CAD was not originally done. As I said, it's a bit more work because here we're, we are uh, using the work that was done by the designer. So in here, if it's not associated, you need to do some additional work, but you can have exactly the same result. Uh, maybe one additional thing. In here, I'm using an assembly fan. So I'm just reusing the components. It's a really neat way to work. But if you're importing the FEM file from, uh, from another solver, so you don't have everything structured properly in a nice assembly fan like that, again, you could do the exact same thing, the same sequence of operation. So instead of moving FEMs around, you would move the, the elements and the nodes directly within the FEM. And it's just a different operation. And that's the something that's pretty useful about journals. It's you're just recording operations. So it doesn't matter what the operation is. You can record anything. You can just rotate nodes, elements. And uh, in the script afterwards, in here somewhere, you'll see the, uh, the value of the angles or uh, displacements that you've decided that you've used. And you can edit them with a script afterwards uh, using parameter tables or anything you want afterwards. So uh, anyway, if you want, I recommend making a full use of journals. It's not something that's used very often, but it's really powerful, especially for complex assemblies like that. Now my simulation is pretty much complete. I did not uh, just put everything back to one window just to have uh, something a bit bigger. As I mentioned, I did not bother adding heat loads and contactors and so on. I just want to show you that, uh, as I said, that thermal modular changer, it works both ways, right? So you can import something from thermal desktop. You can import this model to a uh, thermal desktop as well. So the way you do that, it's simple. First, I just want to verify that my units are in uh, SI and Kelvin. So I'll just change that here. And I'm going to write the solver input file. An XML file. It's uh, it's empty. I don't have anything, but I think it should still work. So uh, let's just write the solver input file here. Oops, I have a labeling conflict. Let's uh, let me just fix that quickly. Whenever you import fans, typically all of your uh, your fans they're all uh, they all have elements and node labels that start at one. So when you do an assembly, you just want to make sure that there is no conflict in the labeling. So I'll just uh, automatically resolve everything. That's it. It should work now. So let me try to write that solver in the file. To my uh, directory. And in here, I should have an XML file somewhere. Here it is. So you can see that's my uh, rotary actuator that I exported from uh, Thermal Desktop. Now I have a solution that I can import into Thermal Desktop. So let me, uh, let me just restart that just to make sure I start with a clean slate. It would, if I uh, just ran directly from here, what it would do is it would um, add in the that new thing in the same drawing. So I want to avoid that. So starting that uh, thermal model exchanger. Take uh, 10 seconds. And in here, before I uh, use that button to export to an XML file, now instead I'll just import my XML file. I'll use my Maya arm. Now you can see it's populating the, the time in here. It's a bit slow at the moment. That's related to uh, the, uh, the OpenCD API. It's uh, still an early version or early release of the, the software. So it's a bit slow. The functions are a bit slow. But I imagine it would be uh, improved in future releases. But it shouldn't be too long. It should be about uh, 30 seconds, maybe, for a model that's simple like that. And now we, we can see we have more information than before. So let's just take a look at the bot file quickly. So we see we have the uh, materials that imported, physical uh, optical properties, thicknesses, and at the warning, we have at the bottom we have a couple of warnings here. Uh, this is just because, um, yeah, I did not really bother applying uh, nice optical properties, so it's uh, converting some stuff. Because the way we uh, for information, the way we express uh, reflectivity is a bit different in the 
thermal desktop and sim center. I believe in thermal desktop it's a fraction of your um, total uh, reflectivity, and uh, in sim center we use the absolute value instead. So just a small difference. I see I had null shells, uh, which is not really supported in thermal desktop. So instead, I'm just changing everything for a very small thickness. And that's about it. If I have contactors, uh, typically you would see a couple of warnings because the way we define contactors or thermal couplings is slightly different in the software. Some of the uh, options that we have are a bit different. But let's just take a look at uh, what has been imported in here. Oops. Just uh, change the visibility bit. Uh, use that text. Oops. Accept something that small. That work. No, doesn't really matter. So you can see everything was imported properly. Um, Again, I'm not sure which materials are defined in that, but you can see, yeah, the materials were imported. I had the uh, null shells, aluminum, titanium. I had the optical properties. It looks like I did, but uh, maybe not real estate values. Anyway, doesn't matter. So you can see that the export works uh, both ways. And just a, a quick disclaimer uh, before uh, you get your hopes really up. This is our version 1.0, as uh, indicated here. It's really a first version. So we expect that not everything is uh, fully uh, uh, supported yet. So I believe there are some, uh, I don't think we support the transfer of uh, 1D and 0D elements yet. Um, some primitives we don't export from the desktop to sim center. The symbols and aliases, they're not uh, necessarily uh, transferred properly, but Anyway, it's a free software, it's a version 1.0, so we released it just to uh, get some feedback from the industry. Uh, so if you want to use it, go ahead, it's free. Um, tell us what you think, if you have any uh, feedback or uh, requests for enhan enhancements, please send them to us, and uh, we'll be, be glad to put those uh, in the list and uh, improve that in the future. So I think that was about it for my uh, presentation. I didn't really talk about this slide here, but you've seen me work with uh, expressions in this demo, so I don't think uh, I need to specify anything else. So in conclusion here, we've done a very simple and quick uh, thermal model for a robotic arm. So we've talked about assisted assembly fans, expressions to control the position, but you can use expressions to control really anything in the same center. We've talked about that uh, thermal model exchanger and journals to automate the operations. So at this point, uh, just go to this slide here. I'll put that link in the chat in case you want to uh, download the software. If I can figure out how to see the chat here, I'll uh, start taking your questions. I see there's a couple of questions already. So the first question from VK is, uh, hello, how do you define the motion of parts, rotational, translational? And if any force transfer is related to the motion, one moving part affecting the loads on the other? Uh, it's a good question. It's a bit more complex. Uh, let's just start with the first part of the question. In here, the way I've defined it is with the type of um, assembly constraint. So if you look at my uh, constraint in here, we have a type of constraint, which is uh, essentially a pivot joint. And in here, you specify the value of the angle that you want to apply. So instead of just uh, using a fixed angle, I'm pointing to uh, an expression that I've defined before. This card changes. So I've defined all of those expressions myself, uh, rotations, I've uh, assigned values to them, and whenever I created all of my uh, pivot joints for all of the rotary actuators, I used a, a variable instead of uh, using a fixed value. You could do um, Anything else, pretty much. So if you wanted, you could do translations as well. Uh, you can parameterize a, a lot of things with the assembly constraints. If I wanted to do something um, from the assembly fan, it would be something a bit similar. So when you um, there there's, there are many ways to do that actually. But one thing you could do is when you move a component, you have to enter a translation or a rotation value. So again, instead of uh, entering a fixed value, 
I could, by the way, press Control E to access that uh, expression table. And I could just add uh, my own rotation value. So I could do by 30 degrees and just uh, change the angles to make sure I don't uh, change the, the units to make sure I don't get a, a mistake. And then after that, when I do an operation, instead of entering 45 degrees, I'll just call uh, this variable by its name. So uh, by rot. So that's how we do it. Now for the second part of your question, if any force transfer is related to the motion, one moving part affecting the loads on the other. Uh, well, in here, I'm really more working on the space system thermal module, which is for thermal analysis. But we do have that capability in the a structural solver. So we have contact objects uh, that we can assign. Just uh, very briefly show them here. So if I create a new solution for a structural analysis. Here at the top. That's a thermal analysis. Use the structural instead. We can create contact objects uh, from here. So a surface to surface contact. And this, when you have motion, the software is going to detect that you have contact. So you, it prevents any penetration, essentially, before between different meshes. If you wanted to do uh, to account for that in a thermal analysis, so you can do a multi-physics analysis. So I have access to that, uh, compute the displacements, loads, and uh, temperatures with that same uh, that same interface and within the same solutions, it's possible as well. Uh, what happens when you do that is essentially uh, it uses the structural solver, Nastran, to solve for the structural loads and displacements, and the thermal solver, TMG, to solve for temperatures. And it exchanges the boundary condition between two solvers, so you can solve both at the same time. Within the thermal uh, solver context, context itself, we have a contact object in here as well, somewhere but it doesn't uh, account for uh, penetration. So it, uh, it doesn't prevent penetration rather. So it's not going to push on uh, other parts. So, so yes, that capability is available. It's um, a bit more complex to access because you have to do a multi-physics solution, but it's possible to do it. We don't do it very often for uh, SST analysis that I've seen, but we do it for many applications uh, on the ground. Next question, do you have documentation to learn to use NXOpen? Yes, we do. Uh, it's a bit complex. You need to have a, a background in the programming, but I can send that to you uh, if you want uh, at the end. I don't see your email address from the, the chat, but if you, can, if you want to send me a, an email uh, at this address here, I'll, I can provide the, uh, the, the documentation that we have probably have a couple of tutorials uh, already integrated within the, the software. So I can uh, point you to those as well. Next question from Malvi as well. What's the, the difference between expression tabs and parameter table? Expression tabs, it's uh, where you define all of your uh, custom expressions. So you, I could have something for one rotation and uh, one translation, I could have the heat flow, the thermal coupling defined from here. And in fact, anytime you create something in here uh, in your solution. So let me just uh, very quickly do a thermal coupling. So I'll uh, just use the elements, uh, let's say coupling from those guys. Oops. Would probably work, but anyway from those elements, and I want to couple that to those elements on the other side. So I'll use those uh, feature elements. Oops, need to put that in the right order. Just like the whole thing, just doing something real quick. Uh, it's a bit much, but anyway, that would create a thermal coupling from those elements to the closest element. And let me just uh, put a value I can recognize in here. So uh, for 2022. If I go back to the expressions tab and I go to uh, all of the expressions, I'll see an expression that has 2022 in here somewhere. So you can see the software automatically assigns a, a parameter for everything you do in, in here. If you have scripts, you don't need to actually go and define the parameters yourself. You can just point to, uh, to stuff in here. But the names are not really uh, easy to remember, let's say. So, uh, 
But anyway, you could point to that. Anytime you enter a value, the software creates a parameter for you, or you can just enter a, a variable name and point to that name in your uh, simulation object instead. So that's the expressions. Essentially, uh, very similar to symbols if you're using thermal desktop. And parameter tables, it's a way to set the values for many different expressions in one go. So to go back to my uh, example with the rotation angles in here, I could have my uh, seven rotation angles. And uh, for a sp specific configuration here, all of those uh, values would be defined. And I could have this, a new configuration. So let's say here, I could have my store configuration. So, and then here, I would out add uh, my expressions for rotation, put them all to zero degrees, and then have a second configuration that's deployed and then set the values of those expressions for the deployed case. So it's just, essentially it's a, it's a 2D table. So you have uh, all of your expressions and all of your uh, cases or uh, configurations. So one solution could use one uh, column in here, one other solution could use another column. That's essentially how we use it. Very impressed, thank you. That's uh, all the questions that we had. Uh, did you have any other questions? Again, just to go back here, if you ever have any questions that you may think of uh, after today, just send me an email in here. I'm always happy to assist. And don't worry, I'm not a salesperson, I'm a technical expert, so I'm not going to jump on your case. I'm uh, just going to answer your questions, and I'll be happy to. If you ever have uh, any questions about actually buying the software or uh, more in, you want to know more information about pricing or licenses or stuff like that, you can ask Dole. I think uh, many people at NASA already know him, but he's the account manager for uh, all of our uh, NASA accounts. So feel free to uh, send him an email as well. Uh, completely a uh, different topic, but could you mention an example when to use the protective layer sim object? So I think uh, that's someone with, who's a bit more familiar with the software. That is not meant for uh, MLI. We had a discussion about that yesterday, actually, with uh, some of my colleagues. It's not meant for MLI. It's really meant for um, when you have, well, protective layers, but uh, physical uh, layers on top, so maybe um, coatings, so a bunch of different coatings on top of something, and you want to model them, uh, model each layer one by one, instead of computing an equivalent uh, conductance with everything, maybe just the sandwich assemblies. So when you have an assembly of several uh, substrates, you can uh, model them using that. So it's, uh, that's the way it's meant to be used. It was, it's not used a lot in the space industry. It's really meant for uh, other applications, for a turbo machinery, maybe for uh, coatings, as I said, when you have different coatings. But the object is available for a uh, in space system thermal if you have a use for it. Since we have a software that supports many different types of applications, sometimes we have some of those objects that come from different applications that you can reuse from in here, but they're not really meant for space applications. So I wouldn't use that to modify, to, to model MLI. That's what you were getting to. Or ablation, for ablation I would use uh, multi-layer shells instead, or 3D models. 